Uh, let me first of all say that I'm delighted to be here and honored to be invited to give a talk here at this very prestigious conference, inspired, of course, by the great CNR Rao. And I should also mention that I do have an association with Bangalore, Bengaluru, sorry, in that I graduated from the National College of Aswambudi in, I forget when, <laughs> long time ago. So I carry very fond memories of Bangalore, so I'm very happy to be back here. Okay, so today what I will talk about is the uh, application of nanotechnology in medicine specifically related to therapeutic applications. And I will differentiate that from the other aspects of nanomedicine as we go along. But I do want to take you on a journey, an overview of the field and where it stands currently. What are the things that we have done well as researchers in this area? What have we failed to accomplish? Okay. So it will be not very technical, but it will be an overview which will give you a good idea of where we stand. Okay. Before I get into the actual topic, I would like to tell you a little bit about our group and what it does. So in NTU, uh, our biomaterials group or biomedical materials group is interested in working very closely with physicians, looking at medical needs, unmet medical needs, as defined by the physicians. And if there is a materials related solution to this problem, medical need, then we work on it together with the physician. So the physician is a part of the research group at all times. So early on we worked on fully degradable coronary stents, shown here, cardiovascular implants as well as ocular implants. And the coronary implant work has led to the founding of a company called Amaranth, not Amarnath, it's Amaranth Medical. Amaranthus is a Greek flower which has some medicinal properties, so it's named after that Greek flower. Uh, so that, that led to the formation of this company, but more recently we've been working in nanomedicine. So in nanomedicine, again, the concentration is on nanotherapeutics as opposed to other applications of nanotechnology. So just so that we are on the same page, I want you to appreciate that there are uh, about four arms of the nanotechnology in medicine uh, research area, okay? As you can see here in this slide, the dominant one is the one on the top, which is nanotherapeutics. So using nanoparticles in particular for therapeutic applications has generated a lot of research interest, a lot of research funding, and has led to substantial sales of products therapeutic products. The second aspect of it on the right hand side deals with in vitro diagnostics. So there are products out there that use particles, particularly gold nanoparticles, to detect various disease markers. Okay? And most of these are very robust analysis, very sensitive analysis in the field that you can do in the field. There is a third branch called um, bioactive materials which is predominantly functionalization or nano-functionalization of a medical device that is implanted in the body so that it integrates well with tissue. Okay? So that is a very important aspect of nanotechnology, but there haven't been too many products approved in this area yet. And then finally, last but not least, is the area of, uh, of in vivo imaging using nanoparticles. And I think we'll hear a little bit about it later on today from Anand Subramani, uh, which focuses on uh, high resolution and contrast imaging, particularly with MRI and PET imaging techniques. <coughs> okay. And then spanning these two areas where the nanoparticles enter the body is the area of nanotoxicology, which is also a very important aspect of nanotechnology in health and medicine. And this is simply not the toxicological effects of implanted nanomaterials or injected nanomaterials, but also the idea of handling these in the workplace, in a manufacturing setting. That is a very important aspect because nanoparticles can enter your body through various means, including the skin, the lung, and so on. So that aspect of exposure to nanoparticles is also a very important part of nanotechnology in medicine or nanomedicine. Okay? 
So I'll concentrate today uh, mostly on nanotherapeutics. As I mentioned before, this is a rapidly evolving field and is expected to reach a very significant market size in 2020. Okay? So understandably, most of the research activity, patent activity, is really in nanotherapeutics, as you can see here. So this is a snapshot taken a little while ago um, <coughs> on the activity, research activity in this field. So significant numbers of patents are generated every year, as you can see here. Okay? And so are the publications. All right? So as, again, most of this is in the area of nanotherapeutics. But translation of these papers or the ideas in the papers has been rather sluggish. So over the last 45 years, only about 38 products have been approved. And in the therapeutic area, most of these are drug delivery products. And I will expand on that a little bit later on. Uh, some of them actually are simply pegylating proteins and then injecting them in the bloodstream. This comes under nanotechnology, but really it's not. So most of my nanotherapeutic work will talk about nanocarriers, which are used to encapsulate drugs or gene silencing molecules, things like this. Okay, But just to, to, to reiterate, the, the rate of translation has not been significantly high over the last 45 years. And we'll go through some of the reasons for this. Also want to emphasize that the majority of the activity in nanotherapeutics deals with particles between about 1 nanometer and 100 nanometers in size. Okay? And the reasons for that also I will explain in a slide or two. But these involve all kinds of different nanoparticles. Dendrimers, polymers, liposomes are very uh, heavily studied and so on. Okay? So why this range of nanoparticles and what, of, what advantages do these nanoparticles offer over microparticles, for example? Okay? That is sort of encaptured uh, in the slide here. At least the one important aspect of the nano size is better, what is called better biodistribution, okay? What that essentially means is that if you inject it into the bloodstream by intravenous administration, you would want it to end up preferentially at the site that you want it to end up, a tumor in the, in the case of cancer, for example, okay? Or atherosclerotic lesions in the case of heart disease and so on. So that distribution is achievable better with nano-sized entities than with micron-sized particles, okay? The reason for the micron-sized particles not being able to achieve that distribution is once you inject microparticles into blood, usually they are phagocytosed and removed fairly quickly from the bloodstream. So they don't have the, the long blood circulation half-life that is required to achieve this distribution that I was mentioning. Okay. So over many years of research, people have found that this range between about 100 to 200 nanometers is where you can get long blood circulation half-lives, um, longer than microparticles. And then it leads to something called the EPR effect, which is enhanced permeation and retention effect. What that means really is that it can accumulate in tissues that have lots of capillaries growing around them, cancer tissues, of course one dominant example of that kind of tissue, okay? So if they do that, because of the small size, they are able to go through the leaky vasculature that surrounds cancer tissue, okay? And once they do that, they are retained in the cancer tissue where they slowly release whatever agent that you have encapsulated in these particles, okay? So that's the EPR effect achievable for particles between 100 and 200 nanometers. At the lower end of the scale, less than about 10 nanometers. It's interesting, the particles in the 100 to 200 nanometers range accumulate in uh, rapidly dividing tissue, but also in the liver and the spleen. It's unavoidable, okay? And we can make use of that concentration in the liver as I will show later on in an application. But generally in the smaller size range, these are cleared by the kidney. So they don't accumulate in the liver and the spleen. Um, and there is some work which uh, is uh, spearheaded by the Cornell University researchers on Cornell dots, 
which is looking at better biodistribution in, in uh, lesions using the small size. But nevertheless, it's an important area to go after for the future. So this summarizes nano versus micro advantages. Okay, so the better biodistribution is one of them. Longer blood half-lives is another one. Um, they are also able to enter cells much more readily than microparticles can. Okay, and you might enhance that entry by putting a positive charge on the outside surface of the nanoparticles. And I will talk, tell you about one example of that later on. Okay. Right? And then the passing through capillaries I've already mentioned as one of the big advantages. So these are the things that attracted people to nanotechnology or nanoparticles for chemotherapy, for therapeutic applications. Okay? Additionally, we have found in recent studies that nanoparticles and nano-sized entities also have optical clarity when injected into the eye, for example. So they don't interfere with vision as much as microparticles would. Okay? So that is an added advantage which you can exploit for localized drug delivery and so on. And I'll tell you an example of that as well. The disadvantages are uh, in general, if you incorporate some drug into a nano sized carrier because of the large area to volume ratio, the release of the drug is much faster by diffusion. Okay? It comes out much faster than from microparticles. So you have to resort to special techniques to encapsulate the drug and prevent it from prematurely releasing in the bloodstream. Okay? They are also prone to aggregation, again because of the large surface area. And that needs to be avoided by suitable surface modifications. Okay? In general also, compared to microparticles, the loading per particle will be much lower than nanoparticles compared to microns, micron size particles. Okay? So, uh, I want to highlight this differentiation between two approaches to targeting cancer tissue with nanoparticles, so nanotechnologies, okay? One is called passive targeting, and that is the EPR effect that I mentioned earlier, where just because you're circulating for a long time in the bloodstream, statistically speaking, your chances of ending up in rapidly dividing cells, that is cancer cells, is much higher than if you are not circulating long periods in the bloodstream, okay? That's called passive targeting. And in fact, as I will show later on, passive targeting is a minimum requirement for active targeting. So passive targeting enables you to get significant amounts of the injected particles to accumulate in the tissue of interest, okay? Only after that will selectivity using targeting, active targeting, be useful, right? So active targeting employs certain molecules on the surface of the particles that allow it to enter the cells, only the cells that you're interested in. So cancer cells typically overexpress certain antigens, for example. So you can have antibodies attached to the surface, which will then go only into cancer cells. Or so that's what you hope to achieve. Okay? So that's the ultimate in selectivity. Why are we very much interested in selectivity is because if you don't have selectivity, you will have lots of side effects. Okay? You can have liver damage, you can have damage in other tissues, especially cardiac tissue, for example. Toxicity to cardiac tissue is very important to avoid. Okay? So that's active versus passive targeting. Alright? So, for best selectivity, we need both. Passive targeting is required as a precondition to selectivity by ligand targeting, okay? And that maximizes tumor tissue accumulation. And this has been the approach followed by most researchers in cancer chemotherapeutics using targeting technologies. And the first product that was approved um, is Doxil. This was approved in 1995 when I was still working for Alza Corporation. It was a tri-pronged, very long drawn out research program. It required three institutions to participate, Alza, UCSF, and the Hebrew University in, in Jerusalem. Okay? And there were lots of missteps along the way. 
a lot of money was wasted, a lot of clinical trials were unsuccessful because we didn't fully understand this need for encapsulation and control of release of the bioactive substance. So the carrier that was used is a nano-sized liposome, about 90 nanometers on the average. Okay. This is a self-assembling molecule lipids that self-assemble into this three-dimensional liposomal structure. And the drug is incorporated either in the membrane, uh, the bilayer, the lipid bilayer, or in the core of the particle. So the first studies put the drug, which is doxorubicin, a fairly amphiphilic drug, in the bilayer of the particle, okay, the lipid bilayer. And then when they went into clinical studies, it was found Okay, so the first clinical trial was carried out with this uh, doxorubicin in the lipid bilayer. Unfortunately, that released the doxorubicin while it was circulating in the bloodstream because there was not enough diffusional control for this molecule inside the bilayer. The diffusion pathway is very tiny, so it's of the order of 10 nanometers in these uh, nanoliposomes. Okay, and because it released prematurely in the bloodstream, it was as good as injecting the naked drug, the dox, the, the doxorubicin by itself. There was no difference. So they lost a lot of money in the early clinical trial just because lack of control of the release. So the second generation product actually put the drug in the core of the liposome, the aqueous core of the liposome. Okay? That's not easy to do, but it can be done with some special techniques, uh, ionic gradients, for example. And once it's in the core, it's actually <coughs> crystallized. So enough of, of the drug is loaded so that it actually crystallizes inside the core. And this crystallization enables the drug to be encapsulated for longer periods of time. Because the rate limiting step now becomes the dissolution of the crystal into the aqueous core first, followed by diffusion, rather than diffusion only. So this is what I meant by you need to resort to special techniques to get it to release for longer periods of time. And with that, of course, the blood half-lives were significantly improved, as you can see in this particular. So this is a well-documented study. It's been reported for many years. Nevertheless, even with Doxil, even with this passive targeting, which certainly reduced side effects, there was still accumulation in the liver and the spleen. That is unavoidable just because of the way intravenous injections work, okay, or the blood circulation works. So we can actually exploit this for gene silencing applications. And I will show why that is possible for this application later on. That means if you can get your particles to accumulate in the liver, you can have certain applications for gene silencing or stopping the production of a protein that is associated with the disease condition, okay? So nanocarriers, this is a summary slide of approved products. Okay, I think this is a 2015 snapshot. But all I want to highlight is that the first, first uh, five products are all based on nanoliposomes or one kind or the other. And they use the same principle of passive targeting with some level of control release. This one has been approved recently, but not uh, worldwide. That does use the targeting like it. The, all the others are nanoparticles of iron oxide and so on that are used for magnetic resonance imaging applications. So the problem in achieving true selectivity or true targeting with ligands is summarized in this slide. So for passive targeting, which is a necessary requirement, not sufficient, necessary requirement for selectivity, you need long blood circulation afterwards. Okay? On the other hand, if you attach a ligand to the outside surface of these particles and hope for selective entry into cells, that selectivity or the ligand density 
is in direct conflict with the PET, the PET molecules that are attached on the surface to enable it to escape uptake by certain kinds of cells. Okay? Ligands, on the other hand, want these particles to enter into certain types of cells. These two are in conflict. And this was not realized until 2012 when there was a publication. I won't have time to go into all the details. Nevertheless, following that publication, people realized that optimization of the ligand density to PED ratio was a significant factor that needs to be looked into. And a couple of companies were spun off after that based on this called Mind Therapeutics is one of them. Unfortunately, they also didn't do very well in the clinic. Uh, reasons for that are different, but uh, we don't have time to go into that today. So this sort of summarizes the fact, first of all, that uh, most of the work in the area of nanotherapeutics concentrates on intravenous injection of particles aimed predominantly at cancer chemotherapy. Okay? Very few other diseases have been addressed. Some have, uh, not very successfully, I might add. But in particular, and the reasons I went into already why ligand targeting is very difficult to do, there are plenty of animal data that shows that they work, uh, but nevertheless, the animal models may actually be a little bit uh, misleading in this particular case. The point I want to make because of the work that we started to do in this area is that in ophthalmic applications there is hardly any activity for a long time of using nanoparticles as a controlled really delivery system. And that's what we sought to address in our work first. So we asked us, ourselves a question, can nanomedicine be useful for non-cancer therapeutics? And we believe the answer is yes, but where Cellular penetration is very important, but also optical clarity. Okay. <coughs> On the other hand, for these to work for sustained periods of time, we need to have certain mechanisms for controlling the drug release from these encapsulated particles. Okay. And we also need fairly high drug loadings and cargo protection, we call it. Particularly in the case of SARNA, as I will show later. People have attempted to do various things to improve this control of relief over long periods. One particular approach involves the use of cholesterol molecules in the bilayer of the liposome that supposedly stiffens it and increases diffusional resistance. But it is only useful for about four to five days of control of relief. That's the maximum you can achieve with these nanocarriers. Okay? And I've just sort of summarize that here, the lack of sustained release is evident in all of these approved products, okay? Except for deposit, which actually turns out to be 10 to 20 microns in size. So they are able to achieve some level of sustained release, but only because the particles are bigger, okay? It's very difficult to achieve sustained release, and we looked at two applications for uh, nanocarriers. One is glaucoma, where the patient suffers from what is called the silent thief of sight. So basically the pressure, the intraocular pressure slowly increases and that puts damage, uh, that damages the optic nerve, slowly leading to blindness without the patient usually realizing what's happening. So this is a very important problem to address and patient compliance with existing therapies is very poor. So that's where the sustained release or sustained action nanoparticles play a big role. There's also a problem with certain glaucoma patients where the doctors perform surgeries to drain the aqueous humor, which is the reason for the high blood uh, of, of the pressure. And after the surgery, this, this opening actually gets closed just because of fibrosis, which is the body's normal reaction to any, any wound or any surgical intervention. So to prevent that from happening, we have looked at delivering a gene silencing molecule against fibrosis. So th these are the two applications I will talk about today, where nano-sized uh, entities are useful in a medical sense for patients. Okay, so this is the need, the medical need. 
with the current treatment for glaucoma, which is putting eye drops, maybe once a day or maybe twice a day, people simply forget to do this. Like I said, it's a very silent thief of sight, and so they don't realize it until it's too late that they have lost or sustained permanent damage to the optic nerve. Okay. So if you can come up with a solution, a medical solution, where the, the drug can act for long periods of time with a single administration, the patient will stand better. And that's what people have been trying to do. They have tried to make the eye drops viscous, but it doesn't help very much because the drop is put on the outside of the eye, and corneal penetration is very poor for most drugs. Only about 2 to 5 percent of the administered drug goes through the cornea, epithelium. Okay? Doesn't work very well. People have tried to put it into uh, uh, contact lenses containing these drugs, but the loading required for many, many days of action is so high that the contact lens becomes translucent or even opaque because the drug is loaded well above the saturation limit of the pollen. Okay? And then people have looked at implants. But again, these cause degrees of discomfort for the patient, and so it's not very patient-friendly. So in talking to the ophthalmologists in Singapore, we figured out that if you can develop a nanoformulation which can be subconjectively injected, subconjectively injection is a very mild injection uh, uh, near the white of your eye, and it can be done with a very small gauge needle. So it's not very painful. <laughs> patients are treated that way anyway for other reasons. So it's very acceptable to patients. But on the other hand, you don't want to do it too often. So the patient uh, doesn't usually come back to the hospital for this procedure. I mean, they have to come back to the hospital for this procedure. You don't want them to come back too often. So whatever you have done, subconjectively, it should last for about two to three months. That is the challenge we have. Very difficult to achieve with nano size carriers. Nano size again is required because of optical clarity. If you inject something into the eye, you would like it to be optically clear. So the scattering of light by nano size entities, as you all can appreciate, much less than by micron, micron size entities. Okay. So to cut a long story short, we looked at liposomes also, and we decided on a particular combination of liposome, and this is the drug here called Latinoprost, which is derivative of prostaglandin and put it into the bilayer using standard techniques of incorporation. And the challenge was really to choose the lipid molecule here such that we were able to load up to about 10% of the drug into that lipid. Okay? So that was the challenge and we went through several iterations. Finally ended up with a few candidate liposomes that showed sustained release over many days of this latinoprost molecule. Okay? And the reason, and we pursued, we tried to figure out exactly what's the mechanism behind this controlled release over many, many days. And it turns out, and this is isothermal calorimetry results, it turns out that there are two specific interactions between the latinoprost molecule and the lipid molecule that we selected. Okay? One is a pi pi interaction, and the other one is something more polar. We don't know exactly what that interaction is, but the pi pi interaction is between the double bonds present in the latinoprost and the uh, lipid molecule. Okay? And this shows pictorially these two interactions. And because of that interaction, it's able to keep the latinoprost drug inside the liposomes long periods. This is called partition control not diffusion control, partition control. And that's possible to do. So with this formulation, after several animal studies and so on, we actually went into a very small human study, six patients in Singapore, very well controlled conditions. Not a clinical study, but a simple uh, human proof of concept study. And we were able to show that with the subconjective injection, the effect on the intraocular pressure lowering, so the bigger this bar, the better the lowering. Uh, was sustained for over 30 to 40 days okay, in these patients. And with that, we spun up a company which is now struggling with a large scale clinical trials in the US. Okay. So that's the first example 
where sustained release using specific interactions is able to achieve sustained action. Okay. The second system I want to talk about is can you do the same thing, not for a small molecule drug, but for uh, an SIRNA molecule, which is about 20 to 22 amino acids long, but it's highly hydrophilic, okay, as you can appreciate. So there is a lot of activity here also over the last several years. Many papers published, many patents, as you can see here. But nothing has been approved yet, except for one which I'll talk about, which has been recently approved. Why? Why? What is the problem with SARNA delivery? So SARNA is one of those uh, therapeutic agents which will not work on their own if you inject it into blood or into other tissues. If you inject it into blood, it's easily broken up or degraded by enzymes, nucleases, for example. Okay? And by itself, it's also not able to enter the cell. So the SARNA therapeutic requires that the SARNA enters the cell and is able to interfere with the genetic machinery there for producing a particular protein that is associated with the disease condition. Okay? So the idea is very powerful in that it's very selective. It will only go into that particular cell and then stop that particular protein from being produced. On the other hand, the disadvantage is that these are not very stable molecules. They don't readily enter cells. So you have to help them with nanocarrier technology. Okay? Along with the other things that I talked about, you need extravasation, meaning that it needs to go through small capillaries and escape into the tissue that you're interested in, and so on. Okay, so you need a carrier that will encapsulate and protect it after administration. You need the small size to enter cells, and you also need a charge on the outer surface for this nanoparticle with the SAR and it go into the cells and deliver its car. Okay. Again, no time to go into all the details of past attempts in this area, but this slide summarizes all of the SARNA clinical trials, okay, is a couple of years old, but nevertheless it tells you, well what does it tell you? The fact is that all of these clinical trials involve SARNA targeted against a liver protein, a protein produced by the liver, which might lead to a lot of other, other diseases, but the carrier system is stopping the production of a liver protein. Okay? And remember what I mentioned earlier about if you inject nanoparticles, most of it goes into the liver. Right? So if this is a case where you can take advantage of that. It's, it's a bad effect in the case of chemotherapeutics for cancer, but in, this, in these cases, you can stop the production of liver proteins. Okay? That's why you see all of these clinical trials involving liver protein production. And as I mentioned before, one of these has been recently approved, and that's this one here, called Patisiram. Alunailam is the company that's very active in this area. So you can more or less say that in the case of gene silencing, the liver protein targets are now pretty well under control. Many companies are working in this area, achieving success. What we wanted to do, as I mentioned before, is a totally different condition. And this is the uh, effect of fibrosis. And fibrosis is a problem in many, many surgical interventions, not just the one I'm going to show you. This one uh, deals against with uh, glaucoma patients who have very high intraocular pressures, who do not respond to the drugs that I mentioned earlier. Okay? There is a subset of patients that have this problem. And for them, the only solution is for the ophthalmologist to go in and create a channel, as I mentioned before, to drain the aqueous humor. Unfortunately, because of fibrosis, this channel gets closed up again very shortly afterwards, within a week. So the surgeon has to either go back in or inject some drugs periodically to prevent this fibrosis from happening. And the drugs that are injected are very cytotoxic. They're not very selective in their actions. They can damage healthy uh, ocular cells as well. So that's a huge problem. So selectivity of action is very important here. 
And so what we addressed was really to inject at the time of surgery, just following surgery, uh, a nanocarrier formulation with SARNA targeted towards fibrosis, which can last for at least two weeks, which is the period of healing for the fibrosis to happen. Okay. So again, what we are doing is to try and encapsulate the enough amounts of the SARNA in our carrier system, inject and still maintain the nanocytes and inject it subconjectively and put a positive charge on the outside of this nanocarrier so that it can enter the fibroblasts that are uh, responsible for the fibrosis. Okay? And the particle system we ended up with is shown here. It's what is called a layer by layer system. Okay? And this again emphasizes the fact that you should not be hung up on any one particular nanomaterial to address all of the disease conditions out there. You must be flexible enough, depending on the disease condition, to go up to different configurations and different designs. So in this case, the core is hydroxyapatite, which is well accepted in the body. Hydroxyapatite has a slightly negative charge, and it can be surrounded by a cationic polymer, first, polyelectrolyte, and then followed by the SARNA, which is negatively charged, and so on. So you can build many layers like this. And that gives you the high drug capacity or the high SARNA capa loading capacity in this case. So this is a schematic of how it's done with the characterization of the spherical size. Um, and this is a characterization of the charge that you build up with each layer of these polyelectrolytes. And the final one is cation. So it has a positive charge. That enables cellular entry. Okay. And we also studied the mechanism of release of the SARNA from these systems. And although I don't have time to go into this, we can actually sustain the release over at least 14 days, if not more. Okay. This is very key to, to this uh, application. And the reason we are able to do this is because uh, each polyelectrolyte layer sort of defoliates okay, and then exposes the SARNA which is then released and then the subsequent underlying layers are exposed or defoliated and then there is also sequential release of the underlying SARNA. How do we know this? We did some FRET studies where we tagged the SARNA with a particular uh, tag red tag in this case, and uh, the polyelar, the, the, the cationic polymer with a different tag, and using the FRET effect, which is energy transfer between two adjacent molecules that are not separated by more than 10 nanometers, we are able to show that the defoliation process of the first layer takes at least about 9 to 10 days, and the subsequent one lasts for 14 days. Okay? So this is how we are able to achieve the sustained release. And this is after entry into cells. I have to emphasize this. So generally many of the particles that enter into cells usually are degraded by the endosomes inside the cells. And then all of the cargo is released immediately. But that doesn't seem to happen in our case. This is very important for sustaining the action over 14 days. Okay? And we did prove this with some in vivo tests using a mouse model where surgically the ophthalmologist went in and created this channel. And then we subconjectively injected this formulation. And again, no time to go through all the details, uh, but we are able to show by PCR and immunoblotting that uh, the production of this particular protein called spark protein is suppressed, and the production of collagen, which is involved in the fibrotic action, is also suppressed. Both are uh, suppressed in this case for 14 days. The suppression is not great. It's very modest, but on the other hand, it lasts for 14 days. And to increase that, we will have to, of course, increase the dosing and so on. But that's doable. So as I mentioned before, fibrosis is a problem with many other conditions. So this platform technology probably can be applied to other conditions. For example, following a heart attack. Okay? When you have a heart attack, one of your coronary arteries gets blocked. And then the tissue downstream of that artery dies, basically. There's also fibrotic covering. Okay, of the tissue because of the injury. That's an injury to the heart, right? 
And that fibrosis stiffens this ventricle and uh, sort of stops its pumping action or the efficiency of the pumping action. So if you can prevent that from happening following a heart attack using a fibrotic coating of, for example, a stent that is used to intervene in any case to, to open up the artery, then you have localized delivery. So that's the other important message I want to give you, is that if you can localize the delivery of your active agent, you get around most of the other problems with intravenous injection. Okay. Uh, so that is key to achieving the maximum efficacy of action as well as duration of action. Okay. So, for example, in the case of diabetic patients, if you want to transplant islets from healthy donors, okay, you can encapsulate them in a polymer that prevents immune cells from attacking it, but allows insulin to escape and so on. Most of these products fail because of fibrosis. So they can prevent immune uh, attack and allow for insulin release, but because of this fibrotic collagen being formed around this diabetes, uh, around these islet cells, they choke off the nutrient supply and kill these cells. So if you can somehow prevent this from happening using this kind of approach, these islet cells can live long enough for the patients to benefit. Okay? So, this is my last slide, summary slide, and I just want to emphasize what we have learned personally in terms of localized delivery versus systemic delivery. As you can see here, and as I've mentioned already, localized delivery increases bioavailability, that is the availability of the drug for its action. And it increases selectivity, as I have shown, and can be used for all kinds of drugs. Okay, including SIRNA molecules. And we are currently addressing some of the other ocular diseases, including uh, AMD, as it's called, back of the eye disease, and so on. Okay. And this is my acknowledgement slide. My collaborator is Dr. Tina Wong from the Singapore Eye Research Institute. She was an active participant in all of our projects, including, I mean, uh, involving ocular disease. My student, who has graduated and gone on to British Columbia, Vancouver, Evonik, the company he's working for, is Jayaganesh Nadrajan. He was the one who developed the glaucoma formulation. And Yang Fai Tan, another PhD student, worked on the SARNA. And Anastasia Darvatan worked on both of these problems. Okay, with that, I conclude my talk and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, Subhu, first, my apologies for misreading the name of uh, Amaranth okay. Medical. Uh, questions from the audience, please. Yes, ma'am. Ah, good question. So the question that I understand is right is whatever you are <coughs> injecting, how does it get eliminated? Residue you see there, you have to get eliminated. Yeah. So the most of the commonly used ones that I talked about actually degrade and can be eliminated very easily by renal filtration. Okay. So nanoliposomes actually degrade into the individual lipid molecules and are cleared. Very easy. All, all of it? All of it will be clear, yes. And uh, when it gets clear and gets into the uh, atmosphere, into the outside world, will that co contaminate anything like water? No, I mean liposomes are very harmless molecules. Harmless? Yeah, lipids. That we, I mean, these, most of these are found in the body. But things like gold nanoparticles, people are not sure how they are eliminated. In fact, gold is very inert, doesn't degrade at all, as you can imagine it's a noble metal, right? And so people do not understand still the clearance mechanism for gold, unless they are very, very small, in which case renal clearance is still possible. What about, what about the air? Uh, the atmosphere for breathing? Uh, you mean if there are nanoparticles in the air? Yes. Yes, you can breathe these in, so you can enter through the lung. 
that is an issue here. Yes. And this has to do more with manufacturing or handling these formulations uh, in a manufacturing setting. So exposure. In fact, uh, I don't know if you know this, but inkjet printers actually have nanoparticles, right? So many of these can actually enter your system through the lung. And we are studying this uh, at NTU with Harvard uh, on the bad effects of inhaling these on a daily basis. So a worker exposure is very, very... Uh, they can't be recycling? Sorry? Recycling? Recycling of, of, the of nano, these... Nano material, the uh, atmosphere and water? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, one more. Uh, my name is Dr. Sachindra Nagul. I work on kytosin uh, uh, based uh, SIRNA delivery systems. We are exploring polyhydroxybutyrate as a remote polymer. And our lab works on biodegradable polymer system developing multifunctional nano drug delivery systems. Uh, so I would uh, want some insights into how are you tackling this SIRNA delivery systems? On what polymers you are using and what are the characterization techniques uh, your lab is working on? <laughs> it's very diverse, I know, but... Yeah, I sort of tried to cover that in the later part of my talk. But basically, the two things that you have to uh, remember for the delivery system is to load enough of the SARNA without premature release. So if you're using kytosan, for example, it might probably complex with the SARNA, which is negatively charged. That's possible to... But if you can make a nanoparticle out of this complex, it might be a reasonable system to look at. But it must also have the ability to do the other thing, which is extravasate, go through capillaries, and enter the cells. But after entering the cells, it should not be degraded in the endosome. That is also important. So right now, we are loading around 100 picomole of HRNA into our system. And we will transfer studies on colon carcinoma cells. Okay. And we are looking at a particular protein called catechetinine. And we are able to find out on 42% inhibition, is what our studies have shown. But we are not, we are not able to make further inroads into it. 42% inhibition, inhibition over how long? 72 hours of the study. Is that not acceptable? 42% inhibition? It is effective, but we are not able to replicate that in the Okay, I, I suggest let's take this discussion sure. in tea time. In the interest of time, we must end this session here. And thank you, Subhu, for such a wonderful uh, talk. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Subhu, once again. Uh, I request Professor Rudra Pratap to kindly present a token of our appreciation to Professor Subhu S. Venkatraman. A big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen.